Uh, ah, that's always scary when I hear those notices. Okay, so uh, we've been, we, we're coming to the end of Tammuz and I see Sora is there and it is there. And before we come to the end of Tammuz, it's one more chance to just talk about what Tammuz is. And, you know, we know the name of Tammuz came from an Avodah Zora in Babylon. And the Avodah Zora, I don't know if you were in my class when I spoke about Tammuz on the retreat, but Tammuz was an idol. And the idol of Tammuz was, um, the idol of Tammuz was a metal idol. Hi, Susan. And um, they would stick soft, soft lead into the eyes of this idol and then they would make a fire underneath the idol and the soft lead would melt and so it would look like the idol was crying and so what happened is that in the ancient times the temple was standing already uh people would come in front of this idol and the idol would cry or look like it was crying and then the people would cry as well. And um, I think, Susan, you were at my class on Tammuz at the retreat when I spoke yes. about Tammuz, that Tammuz was also a false prophet in the Babylonian times and he got executed. And then people after he was executed created a whole story about his person personality, his persona, so when this idol was crying, the people were enacting the story of this false prophet who got executed and made him into like a, a cult hero. And it was the idea of a melodramatic story and everybody weeps and everybody cries from this terrible tragedy of this person who was executed. But he was executed because he was a liar and a false prophet. So the idea of Tammuz this, the energy of Tammuz is crying almost like false tears, um, creating a false drama and then feeling all sad about it. And this turned into a, a Vodazora that people would come and cry, crocodile tears. And Rav Yitzchak Ginsburg asks the question and he says, why do we name the month after this horrible um, of what is Zora and this false narrative of for a, a false prophet, tears. So he says that it's really to help us take this idea of crying and making something into a false narrative and turning it on its head and using this time for doing the opposite, for seeking our truth and exposing lies, especially those lies that enable us to feel sorry for ourselves, where we make ourselves into the victim. So it's actually interesting because I had a situation in my personal life um, this last week, which I didn't realize until this minute, how it fits in absolutely perfectly into the narrative of what is the fixing of Tammuz what is the voter of Tammuz? Because we're coming to the end and then we're going to be an Av and it's a completely different month with a completely different voter. So the month of Tammuz is to see things as they really are and call a spade a spade and don't buy into a false narrative. So what happened in my own life? In my own life, I had two different situations where I felt slighted or insulted or hurt by someone else. And instead of bringing myself to that person and saying, this is what I feel, these are my feelings, this is what I'm dealing with, this is how I'm experiencing what happened, I just chose to shut down and walk away and feel bad. And in both situations, I was led to understand that the correct thing is to not walk away, but to take ownership and say, this is what happened. This is what I experienced. Can we talk about it? But it's much easier to not do that and to just feel bad. To just like say, I got insulted. I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling sad. The other person doesn't love me or care about me enough. And then you just hold on to your melodrama 
that's a very Tammuz thing. And the Tikkun of Tammuz is to not do that, to look at something for what it's real and to say, what's my role in this? Am I not sharing? Am I not bringing my truth? Am I not you know, trying to engage in a real way? Am I co-creating this hurt? So that's like a Tammuz uh, situation very um, clearly. So just to do the Hayom Yom for today, which is Tammuz the 27th, it says a brilliant and renowned scholar, very gifted and remarkably profound in his studies, came to Liozna and threw himself into the study of Hasidus. With his powerful intellectual capacity, he got in a very short time a broad knowledge of Hasidus. At his first Yechidus with the Alter Rebbe, that's the Baal Hatanya, he asked Rebbe, what do I, what's missing from my avoda? What else do I need? And the Rebbe said, you lack nothing because you got fearing and a scholar, but you have to get rid of the Chomets. The Chomets, you, you're too aware of yourself. You're arrogant and to bring in matzah, which is bitl. And then, uh, so, so, uh, and then it, it continues and it says an implement such as a roasting spit may have been used with yeshus, awareness of self. The person imagines himself to be light. But when you have yeshus, this kind of pride, it pushes away the shina because Hashem cannot dwell with the person who's self-involved. So the person or the vessel needs purging through white heat. That's the sparks of the birurim. And when you, when you put a person in a way, like the metaphor is you put them into hot fire, then the yeshus, the arrogance goes out and the person is kind of, ready for real avoda. So what does that mean to get rid of your self-awareness? We, we, we're pretty self-aware as a people and we, we work on ourselves, but can we, can we be con conscientious about our work, but not think of ourselves as such big yeshus, as such a big something? That's, I, I guess, the goal if that means anything to either of you, to, to, to work on serving Hashem, to work on not taking oneself so seriously. And it's interesting, I, I can bring another example of two friends that I have. And they both, I would say, very holy people. And they both have been gifted through different, and this is gonna sound a little intense, but I'm gonna share it anyway. They've both been gifted in, through different ways with knowing who they were in previous life, which is pretty amazing. And for the one person, they're always thinking about it. It's like they're thinking about it and it's very big in their mind who they were and what they were. And for the other person, it's like, so what? Totally doesn't matter. Like, and even though it was also a big person, really, truly, it's like, so what? That's just something that is in my soul. So what? Is like, I knew that you were going to ask that question. You don't That's, have people there with you, Rocha? Yeah, I, I, to, um, we have Tavora Weiss over here from Weisberg. our retreat. Weisberg. Oh, nice. Weisberg. And I think she thought it was going to be a yoga class. So she uh -huh. came here under false pretenses, but she uh, trapped here. Canada with, this year for sure also. But she's she brought a friend Esther. So I have two trips. Oh, wonderful! Two it's so nice. Trips, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so it's interesting. How preoccupied are we? Like even if somebody told you, you know, some big yichas, do do you walk around with like that's who I was, or you know, just. That's how it is without such self-awareness. So it's, it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the Hayom Yom. And I know that that was very interesting. Like how did they know such things? Where did they find out? How can we find out such things? But that is- Exactly. Talk about it this year. Sorry, that's, that's, yeah. 
you know, one, one person has, um, yeah, so I'm not going to disclose on that score, but um, it, it was a little mean of me to mention it and, and then not like <laughs> go, go into more details, but anyway. Oh, okay. oh. So, yeah. Right, whatever the job is, it doesn't really matter. And you do what you do. Okay. Thank you. 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 This week's Pasha, we actually have two Pashiot. It's Matos and uh, Matos and Masai. So um, the first one, the first Pasha starts off and it talks all about making vows. And if a person makes a vow and they're not keeping the vow, how they are held accountable. And the Torah goes into different things if a woman makes a vow and her father or her husband hears her making the vow and he negates the vow then if she breaks it later then she's not accountable because her husband or her father sort of negated the vow but if her husband or her father hears her making the vow and they don't negate the vow and then she breaks it she's held accountable or if she makes the vow herself and nobody is around to negate the vow, then she's accountable to hold to that vow. And if she doesn't hold to that vow, then she's accountable. So first of all, Chaim Miller, who translates uh, one of, he, he did the Gutnik Chumash and he also does uh, another Chumash that I like called the Living Torah. He opens his chapter for this parsha, and he says, do you feel you need to take on extra stringencies for yourself and why? And then there's a little explanation that if you feel like you are tending to misbehave in some way or feel unboundaried in some way, or you're feeling like a little um, cautious around your own ability to stay on track, then you might make for yourself extra vows, but we're not supposed to really be making extra vows on ourselves. We really regard the Torah as sufficient um, rules, but every now and again, people take on extra. So hi, Liz, welcome to the class. And you look very attractive in your Times New, Rome, New Roman. There's like the nice, very, organized L and an I and a Z. Ah, oh, there you are, beautiful. Okay, so we talk- When you say the living Torah, are you talking about R.A. Kaplan? The living, no, it's a big chumash. I actually didn't bring it down with me. It's a big chumash and it's, um, Chaim Miller was asked to write it so that it could be handed out to all the soldiers in Eretz Israel. It's a great chumash. It's got really nice um, explanations Maybe at the end of the class, I'll run upstairs and bring it and show yeah, it. I don't see it on Amazon. Yeah, I, I think that's, if you just go for Chaim Miller, Chumash, or Chaim Miller, the Torah. Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anyway, so, so we're talking, so people sometimes think they need to take on extra stringencies, and we know the whole story of the Nazir. The Nazir is somebody who doesn't cut his hair, decides not to have any kind of grape juice or anything made with grapes. And the story of the Nazir comes right after the story of the woman who was suspected of not being faithful to her husband. So the story in the Torah is there was a woman, she was suspected of not being faithful to her husband, she got warned and such and such and such happened. And then right afterwards, it's like, a man decides to take on extra stringencies on himself and become a Nazir, never to cut his hair, never to drink uh, wine. And then they say, because he saw this situation about the woman who was suspect or under in suspicious circumstances. And then he gets kind of takes on himself and says, I'm never gonna be anywhere close to that tricky 
little close to the edge situation, I'm going to make extra stringencies on myself. But when the Nazir finishes his Nazirut, his time of being extra scrupulous, he actually has to bring a korban to the temple uh, and it's a sin offering because he did it, but he's not, he's not, it wasn't encouraged. He just was being extra, extra cautious on himself. So the same thing here that the Torah starts off and it talks about a woman who made a vow and she made a promise to keep extra stringency or to do something. And then the Torah deals with the, the vow and, and just different uh, details connected to that vow. So what I wanted to talk about in relation to that, which I thought was even more interesting and also one of my teachers, Kana Bracha talks about it, is just in dealing with the vows to talk about um, how important words are in our, in our tradition. That when you say something, your, your, your words really have profound meaning. So, do you make vows often? Are you a vow maker? Just share a story, a very scary one. Yeah, but happened. can I can I put you? Um, okay. Okay. So, um, Devor is going to share a story. No matter and the oh, so wait. Um, let me let me put it on. Yeah, um, Devor is sharing a story, and I'm going to take off the the screenshot. Okay. Are you in the yeah, picture? Hi, everybody. Yeah. Uh, so I listened to Rabbi Gilombic on uh, Matthew Pesachon every day, and he was saying a story of a boy that was working, and he told his boss, you know, I just want to have a day off. Well, he wanted to have a day off, so he told his boss that his grandmother passed away, and he wants, you know, he needs to go to the Levaya. So of course, he, you know, believed him, and he went home. Two days later, you know, the boy the boy's grandmother you know she was healthy and everything and she passed away wow so he's so later on you know he went to Rebham Kanievsky and he said what do I do I feel guilty he said yes you know it's, it's a big sin what you just did you your words really mean a lot and it's quite yeah well like in other words you really caused it to die and you need to learn Mishnayas and you have to learn for her um Mishana and you have to do chupa for it and he felt very sorry. So whatever comes out of the mouth is really, it's serious. Right, well, thank you for that story. So that's kind of the, uh, on those lines, that's what I want to talk about is the power of, of words. So now I'm not in front of the San Francisco bridge. Oh, I like, I like the cabinet. <laughs> that's yeah. good. Yeah, good cabinet. Okay, so. I yeah, I also, I second that. I love the cabinet in the background. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not in San Francisco anymore. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, we know that Hashem created the whole world with words. Um, the Yadaber Hashem, and not the Yadaber, I'm sorry, the Yomer, the Yomer, and let there be, and let there be. And that's just like a very classic teaching that the same way Hashem created the whole world with his words, let there be, let there be, and there was. So we create our world with our words. So words create reality. And um, sorry about that. Uh, so um, this idea of words creating reality, uh, there's a pasuk, uh, where's this nice pasuk? So whatever comes out of his mouth, he shall do, but whatever comes out of his mouth will be done. Like the power of, of a person's words is very awesome. And then just um, talking uh, about the idea of Losh and Horror. So we know, and um, I've told this story many, many times that I think it's in the Talmud, um, uh, a student told, uh, uh, a teacher told his student to go to the marketplace and get the best thing in the market, the most precious thing in the market. And he comes back and he brings a tongue from the marketplace. And then the next day, the master tells the student to go back to the marketplace and bring the worst thing he can find in the market. And he comes back and he brings a tongue. 
So I see Shoshana joined us. Well, uh, welcome Shoshana. She always looks also very beautiful in a circle with the little telephone in the middle. It's very attractive. And um, so how could the student bring the best thing and the worst thing and it's the same thing, it's a tongue. So the student was very clever and he said, my master, the tongue can be an agent of the, the best, you know, good and the, the worst, the tongue. So also we know that the tongue is put into two protective words. Um, sorry, two, I'm just reading, uh, that's fine, Ilana. So the tongue is put into protective walls, the mouth and the teeth, it's like totally guarded. And um, so in terms of loss and horror, we know that it kills the speaker or damages the speaker, the listener and the person about who the words are spoken. Also, when we talk about the vidui on Yom Kippur, so the vidoy, the confession on Yom Kippur mentions 43 sins, 43 avarus. And of these 43 avarus, 11 are connected to speech, speaking about teachers disrespectfully to our parents, to scoffing, to 11 out of 43 sins. So just this idea that words can create reality, um, a little halachic uh, explanation about that. If a person was in the Beit HaMikdash and he said, this animal is going to be used by me for a korban, I want to use this animal for a korban, then he has no right to use that animal anymore. He, with his mouth, he declared it that it's going to be offered as a korban. It's not really his anymore. Um, in terms of our Hebrew calendar, Beit Din or the Sanhedrin would depend on volunteers or, or agents who would just articulate that they had seen the moon rising, the new moon on the horizon. And that was enough to sanctify the moon based on this oral testimony. And we know also, and also from our class on the retreat that when we say brachot, when we say brachas, um, we activating the divine spark in the food and so that actually changes the reality of the food when we say a, a blessing over it. So that's um, another thing of how powerful our speech is. And then Hannah Bracha gave this very beautiful essay on the fact that a person's mouth is really an instrument. Like in the Beis Amikdash, there were different um, golden vessels and things. They, you know, if you put something in something, you carried something, it became a holy vessel and that our, our mouth is a holy vessel and we are supposed to be using our holy vessels to um, declare praise of Hashem. It says in Yeshiyahu, this people that I for formed for myself, that they should speak of my praise, that that's really the reason why we have a mouth. And um, just a really beautiful idea that the Arizal teaches that every word that a Jew pronounces with his lips, an angel gets created. That's pretty intense. In other words, according to what comes out of a person's mouth, something is created. If he speaks words of holiness, a defending angel is created. If he speaks forbidden words, mean words, negative words, an accusing angel is, and I think that when we talk about Loshan Hora, it's not just so-and-so did something, so-and-so isn't a good person, so-and-so, you know, did blah, 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 gossip. It's also, I'm such a nebish, nebuch, I'm a failure, I, you know, I'm going to have a terrible day, I'm no good at this, like any self-defeating talk, any um, talk that is any kind of negative talk, even amongst holy people, there's a lot of my child is impossible. I don't know what's going to become of this child. He's driving me mad. Like all these ways that we use language to shape our reality. I don't know how I'm going to manage this day. Everything just seems okay. terrible. Someone, told me, someone said that, you know, up there, whenever we talk, whenever we say something, 
um, up there, Hashem and all the Malachim are saying Amen. So if it's right. something good, we'll say something, you know, that we want to happen, they're saying Amen. If somebody says something bad, it, you know, it, it could really happen. Um, and then it's done about thoughts also, thoughts also I heard in creates Malachim and um, it, it puts out bad energy. If I'm going to think of you know, my daughter, that she is great, eventually she's going to turn out great. Right. But if I think that, oh, she's a problem, you know, then that's what happens. You put out negative energy and then the results are negative. Right. So it's interesting, this idea of co-creating our reality, that Hashem is constantly recreating the world that he manages and sustains. And we are constantly co-creating with him our reality. So Devorah just shared that everything we say, Malachim upstairs are saying, Amen, Amen. But really our own consciousness and our own visualizations and our own um, goals and agendas for ourselves are, are really powerful. And if we, we project and visualize and articulate for ourselves in different ways positivity, then we kind of creating a, a positive uh, reality. So just a little story. Uh, let me just say yeah. this little story that in the Talmud, it brings two students come to Reb Hillel. And this is reminiscent a little bit of the story about Noah's Teva and how the uh, animals are going in and there's the animals that are Tame and then the animals that are not, uh, sorry, the animals that are Tahor and then the, that, that are pure. And then instead of saying the animals that are impure, they just say the animals that aren't pure. So it's instead of putting it in a negative, it's like the pure animals and the animals that aren't pure. So there's a story in the Talmud of two students that came to Reb Hillel and one says, why do we need to harvest grapes while, um, uh, when we are ritually pure, but we may harvest olives while being ritually impure. That's one student. But uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai asks, why do we need to harvest grapes while we are ritually pure, but we may harvest olives without being ritually pure? So he doesn't say the word impure. So apparently Hillel understood from how cautious Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was with his wording and not to put it in a negative content that in a context, I'm sorry, that he would grow up to be a big rabbi in Israel. And so he did. Okay, so we have another sharing from Devorah. And sure. So we have another yes, sharing from speech, Devorah. Speech and about giving brachas. My friend shared on, we have a conference for like an ad, Lila Nishmas, our classmates, and she was sharing. Uh, everybody was telling her Mazel Tov and how nicely she vinched to everybody. She told them you know, brachas and everything. So she said that once her sister-in-law went away um, for a day together with her and they had a nice time and then they were giving each other brachas and one of them wanted a, a mansion of a house. <laughs> the other one wanted a shidduch for a 25-year-old. And, um, and they were, you know, giving each other brachas. And then a couple of months later, her sister was back because she moved into her mansion. It was there in Pesach. And she was like, she didn't want to share this, that her daughter is like a little of a And a few days later, her daughter got engaged. So they said, look, you know, it really worked. You know, we avenged each other. And so I wanted to share something that, you know, I wanted to avenge or take the opportunity also to give a bracha to her and to myself. You know, we both have sons that, you know, uh, to get married shortly. And, you're looking, um, for she she looking forward. I would believe that you know in the yeah. near future, you know, they're gonna find a shidduch. All right, so we're gonna yeah. so we're gonna yeah. say we're gonna say some brochures for some boys because I also have a son that just turned twenty-two. Oh, so should help, should get engaged so right. Esther, what's your what's your son's name? Aaron Yamtov Ben Esther. Aaron Yamtov Ben Esther and Naftali Svi. And Naftali Svi, Ben Devorelea, Ben Devorelea, and Shimon Yisrael, Ben Brachachana. They should all meet good zivogim in the right time Amen. soon. Amen. Um, when Amen. <laughs> okay, so that's um, talking about the idea of vows and being conscious of our words and um, 
that's uh, really a, a big piece of, of one of the things that the Pasha starts off with. Then we get the whole story, which my husband really has been very preoccupied with. We have the war against Midian, and it's a, a very intense war that before they come into Eretz Israel, Moshe is given instructions that the Bnei Israel have to um, fight a war against Midian. It's a little uh, confusing, and if anybody wants to do research on this, please be my guest and do research. And the research is that it was Balak, who was the king of Moab, who paid money for Bilam to be um, hired, almost like a mercenary, to come up with a plan to defeat the Bnei Israel. It wasn't the Midianites, it was Balak who was king of Moab. And it's true that Bilam was a Midianite, and it was Bilam's idea that A, Bilam tried to curse the Jewish people, and we know that that didn't work out well. Every time he opened his mouth, brochas came out. But then it was the idea of Bilam, and we spoke about this last week a lot, a lot. that Bilam had this idea that if you're going to try and get the Yidin to lose their power and lose their invincibility, you've got to sever their connection with Hashem. And the best way to do that, if Bilam wasn't able to curse them, would be to bring in women to seduce, to seduce them. And we know that they were worshiping Baal Pa'or and through the woman coming and getting uh, involved with the men, um, they created this whole situation where there was a plague and 24,000 people died. And we know that only by the act of Pinchas, who was a zealot and the story with uh, Zimri and Cosby that we spoke about last week, did things kind of come to an end? And Pinchas gets the covenant of peace. And then in this week's Pasha, when they very much are the verge of going into Eretz Yisrael, um, Hashem tells Moshe that they must wage a war and you'd think that maybe the war would be against the Moabites because all of this was started by Balak, who was king of Moab, but actually it's a war against the Midianites. And the Midianites have to be taken out completely, or the men, any woman who, you know, old enough to have known men. Um, and it's, if anyone wants to figure out how come uh, vengeance was brought on the Midianites and not on the Moabites at all. So um, you can let me know. So, uh, so then there's that story. And then um, the next part of the story in uh, the first, uh, the first Pasha out of our two Pashiot is that um, uh, that's pretty much it. And then, uh, then we come to the second Pasha, and this is the Pasha Maase, ma or Maase, ma the, the journeys. And there's a lot to say about the journeys. We know that um, in Asia Torah, they have a whole teaching on the 42 journeys the 42 ways, the 42 principles. And there is a teaching that we all go through our journeys and our um, in coming to becoming who we are, we go on all these different journeys. And, and our second Pasha talks and goes through, they went from here to there, from here to there, they went from here, they camped, then they went to there and it goes on and it goes on and we have um, 42 of these journeys. So actually, is it 49? Uh, it's, I don't 48 know. ways to wisdom from Asia Torah. Yeah, well, when, when you look at the, at the Pesukim, it goes up to 49. Um, and let me just see. 
uh, yeah, the first the first part of actually isn't the the journeys yet. It starts only with Gimel, so that would be forty. I'm I'm actually not sure right now how many journeys there are. I know that I knew that before, but right now it's uh, gone out of my mind. So I don't want to say the wrong number. But anyway, so there's a, a an essay from Jonathan Sachs that I just wanted to share with you. So um, so. Uh, So to be, Jonathan Sachs says, to be a Jew is to be on a journey. That's how the Jewish story begins with Abraham when he first hears the words lech lecha, right? Go on a journey, go to a place you don't even know where you're going. Go just get connected to me and I will lead you. You don't know where you're going. You don't have a map. You don't have a destination, but I will show you where you go. This is how it began in the days of Moshe, when the family had become a people, that they were led. They didn't know um, where okay. they were being led to. Do you have my blanket? Yeah, I'm going to get it. Um, they don't know where they were being led okay. to. I it yeah, um, okay, so, oh, good. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So they set out for X and camped at Y. They set out from Y and camped at X. Okay. So Jonathan Sachs mentions here 42 stages in a journey of 40 years. So that's what I said and I was correct, although I doubted myself. We are the people who travel. We are the people who do not stand still. We are the people for whom time itself is a journey through the wilderness in search of the promised land. And um, it's interesting that, you know, Rebbe Nachman, I remember I was on a retreat uh, for this Parsha, many, many, many years ago, I did a retreat actually with uh, my friend Shimona, and um, I was giving a devout Torah at one of the meals, and I gave over a piece from Rebbe Nachman. And the piece from Rebbe Nachman was that if a person has total faith, imun and bitachon, then they don't have to go anywhere, in a way. That if you are fully, fully, fully connected to the source of everything, the source of all abundance, which we were explaining in the class on brachot, that when we make a bracha, we connecting to that source from where everything comes. And if we connect it to that source, then there's always gonna be abundance in our life. And we said that Balak, particularly this evil king that wanted to eradicate the Jewish people, he wasn't connected to the source of all abundance. He was connected to scarcity mentality. He was connected to envy. They're going to come and they're going to lick up our grass like an ox and pull out the grass even by the roots that there'll be nothing even left on the ground. And that's the scarcity mentality. But if you connect it to this source of all abundance, then Rabbi Nachman saying everything that you need will be provided for you that you can just sit in your place and things will kind of manifest. And, you know, there's a lot to say about that idea, like people who learn in Koilel or people who say, I'm learning, Hashem will take care, that's a shita. People who say, I'm going to go get a job or I'm going to buy life insurance, you know, some people think that's a chasar on any muna. Some people think that's a segula for, for good, for, for, for security and life and blessings in your life. So this idea, so we know that as, as people, we are moving. We, we, that's what defines us as opposed to malachim. Malachim aren't always moving. We moving. So what does it mean? So in one sense, this is a theme familiar in many countries. And many cultures, there's stories told about the journey, and there are many um, uh, hero stories of journeying and the hero struggle. So, Jonathan Brendan Bays, well, uh, Brendan Bays and her journey, the journey, Bays, the journey, yeah. And I think a lot of people are doing healing programs called the journey, right? Maybe that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
Rabbi Sachs, and I shouldn't just call him Jonathan, Lord Rabbi. Um, um, so he, he has um, a few things to define the Jewish journey. He says the journey set out in the book of Shemot and Bamidbar is undertaken by everyone, the whole nation, men, women, children. And in Judaism, it's like we all heroes in the story. It's not just a story about an, one particular hero, but it's the whole, the whole people. And this journey is more than just a single generation. Um, the journey from slavery to the responsibilities of freedom takes time. People don't change overnight. So there's an evolution in this journey. And the Jewish journey began before we born and it's our responsibility to hand it on to those who continue after us. He said that one of the things that makes Abraham beloved to Hashem is that he teaches his children and passes on this like baton of responsibility of the ethos, right? Of, of what it is to be a Jew. And then uh, Rabbi Sachs says, the hero usually encounters a major trial, an adversity, a dragon, a, a, a dark force. And sometimes he could even die facing this adversity or be resurrected. So um, what happens, the Jewish story is different. A lot of times we encountering within ourselves, well, we do encounter adversary from outside. We encounter Amalek, we encounter other nations, but we also learn from Kassidut that every other nation that we encounter is really reflecting something we have to um, fix within ourselves. So we know Amalek, the famous flip of the word Amalek is Safek, right? The same, um, there's a similar, the same gematria for Amalek and Safek, that Safek is our own self-doubt, our doubt of our value, the, the doubt of our mitzvahs and the value of our mitzvahs. And um, we also know that when the Jewish people went into Eretz Israel and they had to encounter nations there. Each nation represents a different media that they have to root out in themselves to enter in and occupy the land. So I guess it's the same with all the nations that they have to fight in their journey through the desert that they're reflections of different things within themselves, fears, weaknesses, <laughs> desire to go back, to doubt their leaders. So um, so Rabbi Sachs says that the human drama here is, is courage versus fear, hope versus despair, um, and the call not to a larger than life hero, but to all of us together to be connected to the past and to kind of forge ahead towards the future. And um, and he says, there's a time for nitzavim when we're standing and we kind of being solid in that space. And there's the time for veyelech moving on. So, um, he says that there's these two opposite ideas of, of being of, of being in one place, of being like a tree we have in yoga, the tree pose, where I was even telling somebody today, she's a kind of a little bit of a nervous person. She always moving. She can't relax before she goes to sleep. I said, stand in the tree pose and just embody a tree. And a tree is standing in one place in the spring, in the summer, in the fall in the winter and wind comes and rain comes and snow comes and whatever. And you're just standing and you kind of just rooted into your place. There's that stillness. And then there's the other part of, you know, where we moving and we journeying and we, we um, moving. So Rabbi Sachs is, he quotes a poem and he says, he quotes this poem from Robert Frost and he says, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep. 
and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So we constantly going, we don't stop. We growing, we growing, we stop, we kind of connect, we internalize and then we like moving again. So his life changing idea that he brings from every Parsha is life is a journey, not a destination. We should constantly set ourselves new challenges that take us out of our comfort zone. Life is growth. Life is, um, is, is uh, opportunity. So Itza likes the poem. Thank you, Itza. I'm glad that you like it. Um, okay, so that's the idea of journeying. But there's an, another piece to the, to the Parsha that I really wanted to speak about. And, um, uh, and that is that in this Parsha, we have the idea of um, cities of refuge. And it's, uh, I wanna find it inside. Um, and just take me a minute uh, to find it. Uh, and yeah, so I can bring it up. It's the end, I'm gonna, see if I can bring it up on the screen. Uh, and let's see, maybe I have to um, find it first. So let me just find it first, if you don't mind. Um, you know what, it's gonna be, I think, complicated. So I'll, I'll just read it for you. So Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the Bene Israel. And you shall say to them, now that you're crossing over the river Yarden to the land of Canaan, you should designate cities for yourself that they should act as refuge cities to where a murderer who killed someone inadvertently can escape. And the cities will act for you as a refuge from the avenge of the victim so that the murderer not die until he stands trial before the court. And the cities that you shall establish, there shall be six refuge cities for you, three across the river Yardane and three in the land of Canaan, and they should be refuge cities. And, um, and then it talks a little bit more about that. So like, what is that? So if you kill, if a person accidentally killed another person, and didn't mean to kill them. So they were given this opportunity to go to a refuge city where the relatives of the person who was murdered wouldn't be able to act and take revenge on that person. So they were enabled to go live with the Levium. And we know that the Levium actually were told to establish in addition to these six um, refuge cities, the, the Levim got also, I think, another 42 cities that they would have as um, here, um, that the, the Levim would have special cities where they would live and these cities uh, would be for them in addition to the refuge cities. So there would be 48 cities all in all. So 40 two of them would be for the Levium and six of them would be for these poor people who through some bad luck or bad misfortune ended up murdering, killing someone else by accident. So my husband said, how many people do you know in your regular life that are murdering people by mistake? Like, does it really happen? Is this something that happens often in our life that just, you know, you, 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 you're hammering something and by accident your hammer flies off and it hits somebody or you, you put up, you, you know, you put up a ladder and um, somehow someone put up a ladder and somehow you walk and you knock the ladder and the person falls down. I mean, how many times are we doing these accidental murders? It doesn't seem that this happens so often, but in fact, the Torah makes a point of creating this refuge city, uh, cities of refuge. So um, before I say something about the, the refuge cities, um, the fact that the Levium had 42 other cities, I think is even 
as interesting or even more interesting because the Torah wanted that any, it's almost like, I'm sorry, because I'm a Lubavitcher, so I'm going to have a Lubavitch reference, but it's almost like throughout this, the land, there should be 42 Chabad houses, 42 places that if anybody has a question, they can go ask the Levium, because who were the Levium? They were the people who weren't working the land, they weren't plowing, they weren't reaping, they weren't sowing, they weren't farming, they were just learning Torah. And the Torah, the Torah actually says that there should be 42 cities that any town in any place in Eretz Israel, if somebody has a question or needs hashpoa, needs advice, needs to talk to a person who's involved in learning, they should be able to go and they, sh they shouldn't have to go too far. There should be a, 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 Le a Levite city nearby that they can get hashpoa. So it's, it's really, to me, sounds like uh, the earliest Chabad house. Like Avram Avinu seems to me to be the first Lubavitcher that he was, you know, carrying everybody. And now they have 42 uh, Torah centers that are available for other people to, um, to be able to access advice or any kind of support. So it's interesting we're coming into Elo, not yet. Usually what happens is we're in the heat of the summer and I have my air conditioning on, but I don't know if it's working here. I hope you guys, Maybe ladies are, are not too hot. Um, we have July, that's kind of hot. And then we have August, that's kind of hot. And usually right in the beginning of Elul, you start you know, feeling this winds, the breeze. And it says in the old city, you know, they used to say the, the winds of tshuva start to blow. So Elul, it's the winds of tshuva. And it says Elul is compared to a city of refuge because um, I think that the psukim of the, the, the pasuk of you should go to a city of refuge actually works out with the letters of Elul that the city of refuge is, the month of Elul is a city of refuge. And another reference to a city of refuge is actually the Teva. When Noah was, you know, the, the, meta, the, the symbolism of the flooding. So Etta is a, a therapist, but we have this idea of flooding, like I'm flooded by emotion or I'm flooded in an emotional interaction with someone else. I feel overwhelmed, I'm getting flooded. Or you, you're living your life and suddenly the problems just seem too much and you flooded, flooded, flooded. And like the situation of the flood, the waters are coming from below, the waters are coming from above, you, you feel like you're drowning. So what are you supposed to do? Enter into the Teva. And the Teva is this, you know, place of refuge, which the word Teva connected to the word Torah, uh, the word of Tefillah of Torah, go into the Teva. Um, okay, it's a thank you for your participation. Um, I'm happy that you were here. We, we, we're going to wrap up in like two minutes anyway. Um, so, okay, so I'll wait. I can wait two minutes. Yeah, so, um, so that idea of, of, of the, the Teva being a, a city of refuge and Elul being a city of refuge and um, somehow these uh, Chabad houses that were established throughout the land. Um, and I was just the, uh, so um, it's if you have to go, there was one thing that I wanted to talk about was connected to the, um, the Kohen Gadol, that it's interesting that the Kohen Gadol, they would stay in the city of refuge until the time came that the Kohen Gadol passed away. And then when the Kohen Gadol passed away, everybody who was in that city of refuge could then go free. But if they try to get out, pay their way out or something until the Kohen Gadol had passed away, they, there was no way that somehow the Kohen Gadol was connected to the people and, and connected um, through uh, uh, this, this idea that the, just like on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol represents all the people and atones for all their sins, he also, they also are active participants in the process. They have to 
they have to do their own part. They have to go to these cities. They have to be surrounded by Levi and they have to kind of think about their ways and be in this process of tshuva and the Kohen Gadol, um, somehow he can't do it without their, he can't just make restitution for them. They have to spend the time, be around the Kohanim, uh, the Levium, be exposed. And it's just an interesting way that the Torah has for tikkun, for repair of putting people in these positive environments and hoping that that's going to have this positive change. So it's, if you have to run, then you should run now. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to open the... Thank you. Thank I'm going you. to open for comments and questions. It's, it's just a little bit of this and a little bit of that and some ideas that maybe spark comments or thoughts or ideas. So um, if anybody has any comments or questions or wants to raise, so Susan, uh, yeah. So you, you muted, so maybe you want to unmute because I don't hear you. You couldn't telepathically Actually, understand what I'm saying. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Just also heads up, her name is Etta. Etta, not Ita. Just thought, you know, share that. I think because uh, okay. I want them to tell me that. So um, this 40 years in the desert, did they know it was going to be 40 years and they had to schlep it out or they didn't know and it just went on and on until 40 years? I, I don't think that they knew. But um, after the Maraglin came back, um, I'm not sure if they knew how long it was going to take. They knew that- Can you imagine the, the headspace of the difference, like not knowing or knowing, you know, how, how, what a head trip it would be to not know or know. I mean, I know that every, I think it was every Tisha B'Av, they would dig graves and lie down in their graves. And in the next day they would see who was alive and, there was like many years that they lay down and that's how they passed away until one year they lay down and nobody passed away. And then they kind of like realized that that tikkun is over and that, you know, I, I don't actually know the answer to that question of if they knew how long it was going to go and, 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 and where they were in terms of the journey, you know, how long it was going to take. I, I don't know if I, have access to that information no, right now. Accepted it. <laughs> um, well, we know that they didn't accept it right away. That when 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 they came back, when the Maraglim came back, and everybody was crying and feeling all bad, then um, then it was told to them that they've lost their chance and they can't go now. That the opportunity has been shut. We know that there was a group of people that said, no, no, we're going to try and go. We're going to go right now. And, and Moshe said, you can't. We, we've lost the blessing. It's not going to happen. And they said, no, 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 we're going to go. And they tried to go and they were intercepted and they were all killed. And we know that we didn't discuss it in the Shir at all. But last week there was the topic of the Benot Salofchat, the daughters of Salofchat. They were daughters that their father had passed away. And when it came time to divide up the land, they were like, well, how will we get land? We don't have any male relatives. It's just a bunch of us daughters. So one of the explanations of how come their father had passed away, that he was in that group of people who said, let's just go now. Let's just try and get into Eretz Israel. And they were, they were killed. They were defeated. Um, another explanation of who Tzalofchat was is we have a parsha where somebody was collecting sticks on Shabbos and then he was, um, he was stoned and there's Mephoshim say that that was Tzalofchat and he did it L'Shem Shemayim because he wanted to show everybody that it's no joke the Shabbos business and if you break Shabbos there's going to be a consequence so whether he died from this reason or that reason, but we do know that there was a group of people who said, we, 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 we feel so bad, let's just try anyway and go. But like all the Breslovers in the Ukraine this, during uh, Bidud, you know, like during uh, the quarantine, you know, they were so zrezas to go. 
don't go, don't go. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? Yeah. Going to Oman, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good example, but that thing that when the broker is with you, then you'll have success. And when it's okay. not, you won't, and that they want it. But in terms of how long and if they knew and and did they know that they would be I, I don't know. I guess it's um if we look back in the Pasukim when Moshe is talking to them if if it's mentioned there at the time, I don't remember. I'm not sure. Any other comments or questions or contributions? Um, anyone else want to say something? Shoshana, do you want to say something out there? Shoshana, I didn't even know you were on. Yeah, that's that circle with the phone. Not really. Um, um... Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm going to say good night and thank long. you. Okay. All right. Sorry, do you want to say something? But you're muted, so I don't hear you. You're still muted. 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 Okay. Um, nothing. I just said I'm too busy at work to make a okay. comment, but it was very, very nice. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So then that's all from me. So, um, uh, Ilana, did you want to say something before we go off? Um, okay. Well, oh, okay. So, uh, just brochas for Ilana that her situation should be re resolved in a, in a good way. And, um, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Thank you so much, Bracham. Thank you. Good job is